So welcome. There we go. We are now live on Facebook. Um, so welcome to Wine and Wisdom for this week. This week is Parashat Matot Masse. We have a very exciting class for, for you. Um, the title of today's class is I'm with you there too. How our mistakes are part of the master plan. Um, tonight's class is sponsored by Mrs. Marilyn Kirshen. I know I see that she's not here yet, but hopefully she'll be with us shortly. It's sponsored in loving memory of her uncle, uh, Irving Sher, uh, whose yard site was uh, just last week. So thank you, Marilyn. If you'd like to sponsor next week's class, we still do not have a sponsor. It is $54. Um, and all of the merit of this Torah study is, uh, is yours. Well not, well, not really, but uh, can, can be dedicated in someone's loving memory or in honor of someone. Um, if you don't, we always begin our class by uh, saying a bracha on a glass of wine. So if you don't have one, please go get one. Uh, but we'll make a bracha now. Um, I'm drinking Isaac's Ram. It's a, a beautiful uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but you can drink whatever you'd like. And as I always say, this can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, anything else you'd like. It can be Torah and tequila. It can be whatever you get to rhyme with it because you're providing anyways. So l'chaim, l'chaim. Please join me in making a bracha. Baruch ata Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam borei peri hagafen. If you are drinking anything else other than wine or grape juice, you should be making a shahakol ni abidvaro. So, this week is Parshat Matot Mase. We have a double portion this week that happens every once in a while. And I believe that this week's Torah portion, in other words, the two of them together, neither of them on their own are the longest Parsha, obviously, but I believe the two of them together is the longest we ever read in one, in one go. Um, as usual, we like to start off with a Parsha overview, um, just to do some justice, because we're not really going to talk that much about the Parsha. We're, we're usually going to zone in on one element. Oh, here's Marilyn. <laughs> um, we're, usually, we're, we're just going to zone in on one element and kind of uh, uh, glean some insight from there. So at least let's do some justice to the Parsha. Uh, Danny, if I can ask you, please, to read for us the Parsha overview of these, this double Parsha, Matot and Masse. <clears throat> Moses conveys the laws governing the annulment of vows to the heads of the tribes of Israel. War is waged against Midian for their role in plotting the moral destruction of Israel. And the Torah gives a detailed account of the war spoils and how they were allocated amongst the people, the warriors, the Levites, and the high priest. The tribes of Reuben and Gad, later joined by half of the tribe of Manasseh, asked for the lands east of the Jordan River as their portion in the promised land, these being prime pasture land for their cattle. Moses is initially angered by the request, but subsequently agrees on the condition that they first join and lead in Israel's conquests of the lands west of the Jordan. <clears throat> Continue. The 42 journeys and encampments of Israel are listed from the exodus to their encampment on the plains of Moab across the river from the land of Canaan, also in Masai. The boundaries of the promised land are given and cities of refuge are designated as havens and places of exile for inadvertent murderers. The daughters of Zelophehad marry within their own tribe of Manasseh so that the estate that they should inherit from their father should not pass to the province of another tribe. Okay, thank you, Danny. And that in short is the double portion of Matot and Masi. Um, today, however, I'd like to open up with a different conversation. Uh oh, you spilled something, Rabbi. Exactly. Yeah. That is, why yeah. is it that we as human beings are always spilling things? What do I mean? You know, God create, created a world, thank God, with lots of different details. You know, there's lots of different species, there's human beings, there's animals, there's uh, plant life, there's inanimate objects. And they all interact beautifully with each other, right? The bees take the nectar from the flowers and this and all the different examples that there are and every, how everything works and there's a beautiful ecosystem and everything works beautifully and everything seems to work perfectly. Um, tell me, when's the last time you saw a squirrel jump off a tree and not land on its two feet? Never. For some reason, everything is always working perfectly in order. The one glaring exception to this rule is we. We the glitch, right? We the people. We are the one glaring exception to this rule. We are constantly making mistakes. We are constantly messing up the plan. We're constantly making 
issues and tzaras and all sorts of things. Um, and today, I'd like to take some time to talk about that. Um, to talk about how we should view ourselves when we mess up, why it is that we're given the ability to mess up, why does God even create the option for us to do wrong? We're obviously going to get a lot into freedom of choice and what role God plays in that and that sort of thing. Um, I was going to say welcome Stephanie, but it seems she came in and had some sort of thing. And he has his hand up. I know, I know we're getting there. Um, and and, 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 and maybe perhaps one of, one of the big questions that we always have, which is, is it, is it an endless cycle? You know, we mess up, we regret what we did, but then somehow the next day we're still doing the same issues, right? So today we're going to talk a lot about failure, as many of you might be familiar with from seeing my Facebook teaser. Uh, but we haven't even begun yet. And Danny has a question. What's up? <laughs> Just a small objection. Squirrels have four feet, not two. I'm sorry. The wine is getting to me already. <laughs> now you see... Up here in the Catskills, the squirrels have two feet. It's a different breed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's get started and see what, what this all has to do with this week's Parsha. Um, Ron, if I can ask you please to read for us text one. Right, so, 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 so here, this is the question for discussion. Are humans the glaring exception to God's otherwise perfect universe? All right. Um, and Ron, if I can ask you please to read for us the first text from this week's Parsha. Um, we're, as, as Danny summarized for us, but here we'll see it in the words of the parasha, where we learn about um, how the, the 42 journeys of the Jewish people throughout their 40 years in the desert, how they're all listed in this week's parasha. Ron, at your leisure. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who left the land of Egypt in their legions under the charge of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded their starting points for, for their journeys according to the word of God. And these were their journeys with their starting points. They journeyed from Ramses in, in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. On the day following the Passover sacrifice, the children of Israel left triumphantly before the eyes of all the Egyptians. Now, I just want to clarify something, okay? Uh, these journeys are being summarized immediately after the journeys happened, okay? So think about this in terms of the way uh, at least according to the, to the most well, well accepted opinion, where the Torah is given to the Jewish people, dictated by God, telling, telling Moshe, and now write down these words after each segment happens, right? So now they finish their 39, 40 uh, uh, journeys in the desert, and now they're all written down in the Torah. But even think about it for us reading it today. We just finished reading about how the Jewish people took all these journeys, and now they're all being summarized for us. So the Medrash asks a very simple question. Why do we need a summary? Why do we need to recap what we just finished reading about? I mean, it's in the book. It's Torah Shemitav. It's the written law. We can just go back and see all the journeys. Why do we need to have them all here written for us? Ron? It is analogous to a king whose son became sick. So he took him to a faraway place to have him healed. On the way back, the father began citing all the stages of their journey, saying to him, this is where we sat. Here we were cold, and here you had a headache. So too God instructed Moses to list all the places the Jewish people angered God. Thus it is stated, these are the journeys. Hold on a second. Thank you, Ron. Hold on a second. So we asked a question, but the, and we give an analogy, but the analogy doesn't really seem to, to do much justice to, 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 to answer our question. I understand that this is Moses reliving trauma. That's pretty clear, right? As he goes through the journey, we talk about the fact that this is a terrible thing that happened here, and this is a terrible thing that happened there, and all the different things that happened along the way. But why are we doing this? Let me ask you a question. Anyone of you been, been through surgery? Do you afterwards come home and say, let me relive this. Let me relive how they did this, how they did that, how painful the recuperation was. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? It was painful enough to go through the experience. Why are you, reca why are you recapping it? Why would you go back and recount the mistakes that the Jewish people uh, uh, failed at in the desert? Why bring up trauma now that it's at a closing point? You'd think we finally got past it. And so really in order to properly appreciate this, um, and welcome Larry, welcome Stephanie, welcome Marilyn, good to have you all with us. Good good Marilyn, you missed the whole introduction where we said that you're the sponsor for tonight and that it's a memory of your uncle. Um, so thank you for sponsoring. Um, so really in order to appreciate this, we have to appreciate that like everything else in the Torah, 
this is not just a technical thing that the Jewish people are being told that these are the 42 journeys, the Jewish people meaning us, that we're being told today that these are the 42 journeys that the Jewish people experienced in the desert, but actually there's a lot of ramification to us today. So the Alter Rebbe, building off uh, a teaching by the Baal Shem Tov, so for those that are not familiar, the Alter Rebbe is the founder of Chabad Hasidus, and the Baal Shem Tov is the founder of Hasidus in general. Um, he shares a very, very powerful insight about these 42 journeys uh, in particular. Um, Arnold, can I ask you to read, please? Text two. What was the purpose of the 42 uh, journeys in the desert? All journeys pointed to, the, uh, to Jericho. The desert through which the Jews traveled is called the desert of the nations, about which it is stated, God led you through the great and awesome desert in which there were snakes, vipers, and, and scorpions, namely an evil place where all negative forces uh, fee, uh, feed. The 42 journeys were so that, that those who hate him flee from, uh, from before him, namely to cut off all vitality from the, the negative forces. This was, the, uh, this was achieved by the, the Jews who were created in the image of God, traveling about the desert. The primary purpose of this journey was to leave Egypt, namely any sort of a con a constant. Thus, all the journeys are considered to be the journeys cut off, cut out of G Egypt until they finally reached Jericho, which represented the, the measure, um, uh, the Messianic era, about which it is stated. And he, uh, he, uh, he let me put on my glasses. <laughs> he shall be animated. Yeah, and he shall be, uh, and he shall be animated. Um, the Hebrew word is veharicho, uh, uh, by the fear of God, and neither with the sight of uh, the sight of his eyes shall he be judged, nor with the hearing of his ears shall he um, be uh, uh, chastised. Translation, tra tradition, tradi tradition has it that Mo uh, Mashiach will join with his, uh, his, sense, his sense of smell um, uh, al aligned with those, uh, with that, with the notion, with the nations of Jericho. Okay, I hope this wasn't too cryptic for anyone. Uh, thank is, you all for reading it for it, us, but allow me is, to summarize. It okay. is cryptic. Okay, allow me to summarize. The altar of Danny, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, um, the altar is making a very simple point here. He says, listen, Every journey that the Jewish people went through in the desert is a journey that we go through today. And in fact, those journeys and their destination in the land of Israel, beginning with Jericho, for those of you that are familiar with a little bit of Jewish history, Joshua, who was the one who led the Jewish people into, into, into Egypt, uh, into the land of Israel, um, does so by starting with, with the city of Jericho, by conquering the city of Jericho. And the Alter Rebbe is pointing out that the 42 journeys are A, a journey that each of us goes through in our own life, but B... The, the cosmic journey that the world is taking from creation until uh, the times of Mashiach. Yeah. And he has some scriptural references for, what, for certain verses that we see that refer to the time of Mashiach that use a word that's similar to Jericho. And most importantly, he says that everything along the way is part of that journey. In other words, the Jewish people are put here in this world in order to eradicate evil. And that was done during their time in the desert. But that time in the desert was kind of a microcosm of our general journey over over uh, global history, yes, Danny. You're you're muted. I just wanted to ask you. So the the Veherico is is that what Jericho is named after? Is there a connection between the two words? No, technically there's no connection. The Alter Rebbe is making here a Kabbalistic connection. Veherico uh -huh. uh, means no to animate or to smell, um, and that that term is used with regards to Mashiach that he's that he's going to smell and judge by the sight of his by by, by his sense of smell. Um, but here's, here's the point I want to make. You know, among those 42 journeys, there were some very negative journeys. There were times when the Jewish people wanted meat, right? The manna wasn't enough for them. Terrible. It was a terrible offense, right? There was the rebellion of Korach. There were all sorts of terrible occurrences. There was an episode with, with the spy. Well, I guess the episode with the spies kind of triggers the 40 years in the desert. So I don't know if that's considered part of it. You know, all the complaints that we know, the famous complaints that the Jewish people do along the way. Many Jews died along the way from diseases and, and plagues that came as a result uh, uh, you know, a repercussion of negative actions that they did. So essentially what the author is saying here is, and, and, and this is based on the Baal Shem Tov, he's saying that part of our, the world's journey 
and our personal journey is going to involve downs. There's going to be ups, but there's also going to be downs. And that's part of it, okay? And this starts to touch on perhaps one of the most beautiful things the Hasidah shares with us. And that is, in very short, the term Yerida Tzorah Khalif, which means that every down leads to an up, okay? Yerida Tzorah Khalif means that every descent leads to an ascent. No matter what it is in life, every time we go down, we should know that there's something, something that's coming up afterwards. Now, this is as simple as if a child is jumping on a trampoline and they push the fabric of the trampoline down, inevitably they are going to, to, to rebound back up, right? But this is also true of all of our experiences in life, right? If we have slip-ups, if we have moments when we feel like, up, oh, up, oh, I slipped up, we should know that there's something more powerful that's coming afterwards. If there's some sort of down, we should know that there, that, that there is an up. Um, hold on, let me just let someone in here. As a cyclist, we, do the, we say the opposite. <laughs> when we're going up a hill, they say, don't worry, we're gonna go down soon. What comes up must go down, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, welcome, Sam Chabracha. Good to have you with us. So where are we here? So just, you got it. So just prior to entering the land of Israel, after a long and arduous journey, you know, with many downs, the Jewish people are now revisiting those downs to appreciate the fact that after every down comes an up. This is very, very interesting. You cannot have that perspective while you're having the down, right? Every single one of us has had that infuriating friend who, who you know, I shouldn't say infuriating, I should say that friend who means very well that while you're suffering some terrible loss or some terrible thing, he says, don't worry, you'll get over it. There will be, there will be life after this. You're like, I know there'll be light at life after this, but I can't think about that now, right? Nobody can think about that now. And in fact, sometimes life improves afterwards, right? It's, let's give one of the classic examples, right? Someone loses their job. They're fired from their job. And as a result, that ends up being the, the force that propels them to start their own business, a mega multi-million dollar business, right? And actually, you, you talk to them the day they get fired, it's not a good thing to share with them. You might become a mega millionaire by founding your own business, right? It's hard to think about it in the moment. So retroactively in Parsha, Matos Masa, in this week's Parsha, Moshe Rabbeinu or, or, or the Torah and God are sharing with us this message. Let's see how the Rebbe emphasizes this in text three. Um, Marilyn, can you read for us, please? Marilyn? You're, you're still muted. There you go. By definition, the soul's journey through the desert of this world involved a dramatic plunge from the greatest heights to the absolute nadir, a place of utter godly concealment. While it's true that the purpose of this plunge is for the height to which it will eventually reach, the reality is that during the journey, it is very much, it very much feels like a downfall. It is only that thereby and later on one reaches greater heights. Now, when does it feel this way? During the journey, of course, when one finally reaches the mountaintop, they are able to see the true purpose of the exile below. That is uh, that it is was that it was really nothing else other than a part of the climate. Thank you, Marilyn. So it turns out that now, right before the Jewish people enter the land of Israel, oh, hold on. No, we're still in the middle of the text. Go ahead, Marilyn. This then is the idea of the analogy that describes how on the way back, the father began citing all the stages of their journey. After the plunge down, and through the 42 journeys begins the process of going back and climbing up. That means retracing one's steps along the very same journey and appreciating how those downfalls were really part of the climb up. Thus God said, list all the places the Jewish people angered me with proper framing. We will thank God for the challenges for we will understand how they were truly a form of kindness bring us higher. So standing on the cusp of their entry into the promised land, it's time to take stock and to review, right? The Jewish people have to appreciate that even though there might be downs in life, those downs lead to up, right? No matter what that down might be, every failure in life always propels us to go for it, for, forward. Oh, perfect. Beautiful. 
such a beautiful, nicely packaged class. We could just end right here, right? And look at that. I told you guys 75 minutes and we're only 20 minutes in and we're doing well, right? <laughs> we have one big problem. We have one big problem. It's nice and fine and dandy. Welcome, Vicky. Good to have you with us. Thank you for helping with the tech. <laughs> um, don't both of you unmute at the same time because then we'll have feedback. Um, it's nice. We we'll figure out. We we'll figure out. It was hard, but we we'll figure out. But hold on, we're getting some feedback, so you have to make sure one of them is mute as well. <clears throat> so uh, it's all nice and fine and dandy to say all of this when you are talking about a down that God gives you, right? Or or, or let's not even say God. Let's say, I mean, obviously everything comes from God, but let's say you know a circumstance that you have in life, right? You get fired from a job. Let's use that example again, right? It's a circumstance that happens to you. Obviously, it could be that a person. Uh, was it such a terrible employee that as a result of their actions, that's why they get fired. Well, let's say that's not what happened. The person just gets let go, right? Or a person loses a loved one or, or uh, circumstances that God gives, gives to us, right? There's no such thing as, as happenstance. So it's obviously, obviously all comes from God. So here comes a beautiful lesson. You might think it's a down. It's not really a down. It's you read that it's a descent. It's coming to an ascent. Don't worry. It's all going to be good. It's going to lead you to even greater heights, et cetera. Beautiful, powerful lesson. Let me ask you a question. Can we say the same thing about when we mess up? <laughs> Let's say it's not getting fired from a job. Let's say it's saying something stupid or doing something idiotic. And don't you all raise your hands at once and say you did that, you know? <laughs> but we've all been there where we mess things up. We know what Hashem wants from us. We know what uh, we're supposed to be doing in this situation, but we didn't. I shouldn't be there. Here I'm talking to a whole bunch of tzaddikim. I need a different crowd for this class. <laughs> we don't know what you're talking about. Uh, a whole bunch of holy righteous people. They're like, slip up? What is this? Hashem wants something? I always do it. Anyways, let me ask you a question, all right? <laughs> imagine you have... Um, imagine you have someone who, uh, I don't know, you know, is unfaithful in his marriage, right? His, his wife uh, confronts him, and he looks at her and he goes, you're right. I messed up, but don't worry. It's for it's going to be good. It's going to be better afterwards. <laughs> the first thing you would get is a slap across the face, right? This is essentially what we're telling God. You're telling me that when there's something negative that I have done because I messed up, my approach should be, don't worry, it's a descent, but it's going to lead to an ascent. What, in other words, in, in very short, the question we're asking is, what about the failures that we have wrote about? Let's read this in the Rebbe's words. Larry, can you read for us, please? Text four. <clears throat> one can understand that inasmuch as the overall plunge into the wilderness of the desert is set up in advance by God, it is ultimately rendered a kindness and part of the climb up. But those times that the Jews angered God in the desert were a result of the Jews' wanton sins. In other words, the Jews set in motion a downfall beyond what was ordained from on high. What then compels us to argue that they too are part of the climb up? Uh, hold on, I think there's a little more. No, no, that's it. Um, so there, there, there was asking a very fair question here, right? And I, I should point out that this is a, uh, it's a fairly profound theological question because essentially what we're asking is, is, out, is when we mess up, when we sin, when we fail, is that part of the plan? Right? Is that also within the pale of God's plan? Or is that me messing God's plan up? And you see why this can get... Uh, why, why we can have a whole class on this topic, because this, this can be some heavy philosophical work here. I, I don't know that we're going to fully do justice to it, but at least let's hack away a, li a little bit at it, okay? In short, what I'd like to suggest is that the answer is yes. The answer is that even when we mess up, that is something, I'll stop short of saying to celebrate, but that is something that we should recognize is an opportunity to propel us forward to a better situation. By way of an of analogy, let me say like this. Um, parents in the room, do we have some parents in the room? Raise your hand. We have a couple of parents here, right? There we go. Okay, great. Um, when your child, you know, I'll, 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 speak to, I'll, speak, I'll speak for myself. I have now, many of you know, I have a 10 month old girl, right? Which means that she has just learned how to crawl all over the place. And she's, uh, scoot she's uh, scooting around and she's crawling and she's, uh, what do they call it when they when they're cruising around when she when, when she walks along objects along the room, etc. We're here now in the Catskills. She hangs out on, on the front porch a lot. The front porch has three steps that go downwards, 
Now she has completely mastered going up the stairs. Everybody remember this stage? She has totally mastered going up the stairs. She has no idea what to do to get down. And so about halfway up the stairs, right up, she turns around and tumbles down the stairs. Now, here's, here's a question. Here's a question. Um, when I watch Bina go towards the end of the stairs, and then she inevitably tumbles down the stairs. Now, I, as I'm watching, I run towards her. I try to catch her. I even, let me ask you a question. Is this something that I um, want to happen to her? Certainly not. I'm not sadistic. I don't want my daughter to fall down a set of stairs and, 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 and bang, bang herself up, right? Even though nothing's going to happen to her. We're talking about two, three short stairs. At the end of it, she'll cry for a little bit. Maybe I'll have a little bang and she moves on, right? If you're not a parent, you'll pardon the, uh, the loose way of talking about this, but it's true. That's, that's the way growing up works. Now, but let me ask you a question. I also don't want Bina a little further past the three steps if she would stop, somehow master she is a child prodigy, but not this much. If she would somehow master how to open the gate and get out onto the road, she can crawl out onto the road and heaven forbid what can happen then, right? That's also something I don't want to happen to her. But there's a, there's a tremendous difference between the two. Her going out, out onto the road in my mind is not an option. I never leave that to be an option in her world. If, if the gate was open, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave her out of my sight if she started crawling towards the air, no matter what else was going on, even if I lost $500,000 because of some, out of something that was going on, I would be taking her away from her because she wouldn't go there, right? I don't understand. I also don't want her to fall down the stairs. How come I don't do that? Going down the stairs, even though it's something, tumbling down the stairs, even though it's something that I don't want, I don't wish it to happen to her, but it's an option that I leave open for her. In fact, a couple minutes after she tumbled down the stairs, let's say you have somebody, and this often happens, somebody who wasn't a parent, and they're like, oh my gosh, she fell down the stairs. I'm like, you know, it happens. It happens. She'll learn. Now, that's how she learns to be traumatized, not to go down the stairs, and to realize that this is, you know, this is, there's, there's boundaries, and you have to learn, right? Parents that, 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 that have children that are in the middle of learning how to walk, this happens all the time, right? They tumble down. That's what happens. You fall, you pick yourself back up again. That's part of the things you need to learn in life. Let's use this analogy to describe how Hashem approaches our ability to sin, okay? Does Hashem want us to slip out? Does he want us to sin? Certainly not. Certainly not. However, Hashem left us those two options. When Hashem created the world, he created the world with two paths. One where we do the right thing, and one where we do the wrong thing. Now, did Hashem push us to do the wrong thing? No. Just like I don't push my daughter ever down the stairs. Ever. <laughs> right? I would never do that. But those two options were made available. There are other things that Hashem doesn't even give us the option to do. There are other parts of God's plan that we as human beings cannot touch. But these two options are open here in front of us. So even when we sin, although we cannot say that God made us sin, that was completely our freedom of choice, but we are not outside of the pale of God's plan. Okay? We are clearly within what God wants in terms of the creation of the world. That, again, I, I, again I, I recognize this is a little philosophically challenging, right? It's not something God wants, but it's not against his plan, okay? It, it is against his desire. It's not what he wants to do, but it's not against his plan. There's no better way to illustrate this than with one of the opening verses of the Torah. Kalman, can you read for us, please? A verse from Bereshit. Uh, hold on, text 4a, and then we'll read a medrash on that verse. Go ahead. God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. Okay, everybody knows what's coming, right? This is one of the most problematic verses in the Torah. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. What's going on over here? I thought there's only God creating the world. So the Medrash discusses. Go ahead, Kalman. When Moses transcribed the Torah, he dutifully recorded God's acts of creation in each of the first six days. When he reached the verse and God said, let us make man in our image and likeness, he was mortified. Master of the universe, he protested, why are you providing an argument for the heretics? So Moses is, is, is listening to God. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Because um, he implied that there was more than one God. So God right. responded, just write it. Whoever seeks to err is free to do so. This is such a powerful medrash. What's going on over here? By, by the way, God is not describing um, uh, a theory here. Moses is not worried about a theory here. In practice, many Christians read these verses and use that to back up certain uh, pagan beliefs that they have, right? Okay. Um, but what's going on over here? Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, look, 
I'm not planning to create a world. You might want a world like that, but I'm not planning to create a world where sin is not an option. No, no, no. I'm planning to create a world with two options. And I want that option to be there. What you're asking of me is take away the ability for people to make mistakes. Take away the ability for people to fail. Of course, God could have done that, but he didn't want to create the world this way. So even when a, when, when a Jew or the Jews as a whole fail, that too is part of the pale. It's within the, the pale of God's plan. Let's see this in the words of the Rebbe. Baron, if you can read for us, please, text five. Any uh, deterioration that society or an individual experiences as a result of human activity and the irresponsible exercise of free choices ultimately in accordance with God's plan and therefore must also lead to a productive goal. In fact, these deteriorations are part of the part, part and parcel of God's productive goal. True, a sinful act is absolutely contrary to God's will. However, its result, the decline in society's moral standing or in an individual does not contradict his will. Consequently, the decline is not a genuine descent, but rather a necessary component of the ascent to which it leads. Thank you, Baron. The rabbi is introducing a very revolutionary idea here. The rabbi says, let's remember that it's axiomatic to Judaism to believe that God is the ultimate good that there is here in this world. Hold on a second. How can someone who is the ultimate good provide us with two options? One of those options is bad. Hold on a second. God tells us clearly in the Torah that that option is bad, right? I put before you today the way of, uh, of, of, of good, which is life, and the way, a way of bad, which is death. God himself says that there's a bad option. So if, if, if within the pale of God's plan, there is an option which is bad, how can that too come from God, which is ultimately good? And think about this. We're not just talking about the verses in the Torah where God says, Nasa, Adam, let us make man, which leads to, to, to or, or leaves the ability for people to make mistakes. This happens all the time. Think about when God creates the world, right? He puts Adam, Adam in, in, in the Garden of Eden. He gives him one law, right? One, one, uh, one mitzvah. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge. And then what does he do? Sends a serpent to go, to go try to persuade him. God is constantly, I don't, I don't know if you want to say encouraging us to sin, certainly not encouraging us, but, but setting us up for failure. He's setting up options for us to fail all the time. How does that come from God's goodness? So says the Rebbe, if you truly appreciate that even when you go down, it's to go up, then you recognize that out of God's ultimate goodness, of course, he is the ultimate good that there is in this world. All he has done is put before us two paths towards good. One that's a direct path towards good, and one that's maybe perhaps a, a little bit of a windier path towards good. Oh, you guys hear the thunder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It just it just started to pour in. Oh, yeah. um, it's a good thing we're inside. Sometimes I teach outside. Let me just make sure I didn't leave any of my books outside. <coughs> we're good. We're good. So, <clears throat> so it turns out that God leaves us two paths towards good. One is a direct path towards good, and one is perhaps a little bit of a wide path, which goes down, and then it goes up. The rabbi elaborates on this idea in text six. Phil, can you, can you read for us, please? Oh, hold on. Go ahead. Hashem is a paragon of goodness, and it is a, the nature of one who is good to always bestow goodness. Therefore, inasmuch as Hashem is the one who enables the deterioration, we must conclude that no alternative path exists to arrive at an ascent of this magnitude. For had there been an easier or better path, one that avoids suffering and lapses, why would Hashem provide a more difficult route? Right, thank you, Phil. I hope you guys are following with me here. I have a question. Hold on, hold on. The Rebbe is not stopping. He says, if we truly appreciate that God is the ultimate good and that everything that comes down from God is good, then not only do we recognize that both of these paths are good, but actually the, uh, the other path must lead to an even greater good. Why? Because if not, we can ask the question, why would God do this? Why would God allow somebody to fail? If not for it to lead, why would, allow, why would God allow somebody to go down if not for it to bring to a greater up? Now let me just clarify. The freedom of choice was never taken away here. I hope everybody's with me here. The freedom of choice was never taken away. Not every person who sins then goes and goes back up. We don't celebrate when somebody sins. And we're going to talk about that shortly. 
how it's specifically in retrospect that we look and say, okay, if someone sinned, now it's an opportunity for them, for, them, for, them, for them to reach a greater height. So two things are true. First of all, that the advantage of someone who sins is that this can lead to a greater good than they could have arrived at if they hadn't sinned. Failure must lead to a better and greater good. And not only that, but it must be, again, because God is the ultimate good in the world, it must be there was no other way for this person to reach such a great height. Why? Because if there was another way for them to reach such a great height, then God would have obviously given them that. If there was another way without them failing, then obviously God, God would have given that to them. Right? So God starts off and he tells us, here's two paths. Here's the right one. Here's the wrong one. And God wants us to do the right one. Don't you get me wrong here. But even if we do the wrong one, there is a greater good that comes out. But let's go back to that analogy with the children, right? A child is learning to walk. No parent wants his child to fall. They fall, they hurt themselves. But the two paths that the parent leaves, leaves available, because remember, there's lots of other paths. The child can stick his hand into a burning fire. That's not an option. The child can run out, of, run out in front of a car that, that's speeding down at 60 miles an hour. That's not an option. And the parent makes sure those things don't happen. The two options that the parent does leave open to the child, which is either just learn to walk and start running or fall along the way and that will teach you to walk. Both of those lead to good results. And when the child slips up and falls and, 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 and literally falls and then learns to walk, there is a greater benefit to that because they have now learned from their experience. And we're going to elaborate that uh, shortly. Uh, but first, there are some questions here. Yes, Tom. Well, maybe you'll get to it. But it sounds like what the Rebbe is saying is that it's preferable that people make mistakes versus not make mistakes. We are going to wrestle with that shortly. Okay. Danny, go ahead. <clears throat> but there's still the personal choice. So uh, the, the worry is what if, uh, if the individual keeps making the wrong choices every time there's the wrong choice and then the opportunity to take the right choice later and but if if it's a series of wrong choices if you always keep black betting on on the wrong color red and black in roulette eventually you'll lose absolutely um and and I, I don't think you're just describing theory there are many people that get stuck in life in cycles of failure right where their failure leads to more failure leads to more we're going to talk about this a little bit but ultimately we're never going to take away the fact that a human being has freedom of choice Right now, we're trying to talk about this within one segment, when a person sins, and, 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 and the opposite is true. What we're trying to do is we're trying to equip someone who sins or someone who failed, because we all, as we read earlier, we all on this Zoom have had moments in life when we slipped up. What we're trying to do is equip ourselves, once we've slipped up, what is the proper retrospect? And to bring it back to this week's Parsha, that is what God is teaching us in this week's Parsha. That occasionally, and perhaps always, even after negative situations, it's worth it to recap. It's worth it to look back and to appreciate what happened and what is my new potential now that I may have slipped up. But you still have the responsibility, the personal choice. Absolutely. That's never taken away. Recognize the, the learning. Yeah. Exactly. That's never taken away from you. So let's move on now to Tech 7. With Tech 7, the Rebbe now brings it back to this week's Parsha. Um, Ron, if you can read for us, please. A little bit of a long text. The truth is that the reason why a person can sometimes make the mistake to listen to their Yitzhahara and stumble into sin is because the Yitzhahara has been dispatched from on high to tempt them to sin. It emerges that even those lows resulting from sin are also part of the master plan to bring one to Teshuvah that introduces even greater light through the process of transforming sin into merit. Hold on, so we keep going. This too is the Midrash's par parable. The father points out, here you caused your head to hurt. Even in a situation that the prince brings about his own malady with his own bad choices, it, 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 it isn't really only the son's doing. Rather, it is part of the healing journey through which the king escorts him. Thus, it is abundantly clear that the purpose of the malady is not just so that the sun can reach the plateau of one who is healed, rather much greater heights, namely retroactively rendering his sins as merits. Thank you, Ron. So just as a child may sometimes fall, but that falling teaches them and gives them experience to learn how to walk, 
all the journeys in the desert, even the negative, were part of the subsequent aliyah. It's part of the subsequent going up. This explains why in this week's parsha it was worth rehashing just before entering the promised land to appreciate everything that happened all the way to take stock and remind us how to look at every part of life, sins included. Okay. Let's get, let's get personal again for a second. So what is the nature of the Aliyah? What, what is, if a person chooses to sin, what is the ascent that comes after the descent? What is it? And, and not only comes out to the descent, but can only come about to, through the descent. Let's start by polling the crowd, if you guys don't mind. Question for discussion. Anybody would like to chime in here? I would love to hear people's, I, I understand this is a little bit personal, and perhaps people are not comfortable sharing, but if you are, I would love to hear, tell me about a negative experience in your life and how afterwards you gained from that negative experience or you, 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 you gained from that, that failure, so to speak. Anybody? Don't all jump in. I speak for myself when it comes to business. Okay. Now there's been countless times that, you know, you lose a contract or you even have to shut down and move and you think that you know, the sky is falling and then you dial ahead um, six months later and things are a lot better than they were. Yeah, I think in business, many people know about that. This happens in relationships too, right? We make mistakes, we say things we regret. It takes a while until we learn that we said something stupid. Then we, uh, we hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we learn from our mistakes, right? We regret what we said. And uh, if it's a relationship, let's say with a spouse, your marriage can become deeper, right? A relationship that has, that has survived, that has weathered a storm is deeper than the relationship that there was before. Anybody else have any other examples they want to share? The reason why I mention relationships is because that's where we're getting to now. In our relationship with God, there is something unique that happens after we slip up and we come back to Hashem. What in classic Jewish literature is called teshuva, right? Which is normally translated as repentance, but probably more accurately is return. There is a very powerful uh, line that the Talmud throws out about teshuva. Kalman, you're unmuted. You want to you just read it for us? Um, in the place where penitents stand, even the perfectly righteous cannot stand. I so this is a famous, me. what was that? I was thinking about that um, a while ago. So this is a very famous statement, statement by the Talmud. This is from Tractate Brachot. And the Talmud tells us that there's tzaddikim, people that are righteous, let's say never sinned in their entire life. And then there are people who sinned, slipped up, and now have done repentance and now are, are no longer sin. Naturally, we would think that the person who is a tzaddik is at a higher stage than the Baal Teshuvah, than the one who repented. Tells us the Talmud, nope, nope. When someone messes up and then comes, come, comes back to God, there's something deeper about the relationship with God. They stand at a higher plateau. Hmm? Why? Why? What's going on? So it turns out that very simply, um, and the tract in, in the, the Talmud and tract Yuma, uh, uh, which by the way is the same tract that my, that my brother just made a seum on, um, elaborates on this and it's in, in, in a one liner it's because someone who sinned and now returns to God is now is has now done teshuva has something called zedonot nas in lo kazachiot his sins become like merits for him his transgressions against God are transformed with true teshuva to be like mitzvot to be meritorious in the eyes of God that they too are are good how does that happen that happens through through longing, through longing, through the, the distance that someone who slips up feels from God and the longing, right? The distance makes the heart grow fonder. Even in a relationship, we could say that that's why a relationship grows deeper after it, it, it suffers a fracture. Why? Because when we have that distance from God, teshuva is the act of not just regretting the bad act, but actually feeling distant from God and longing to be closer to Hashem. A longing that a tzaddik can never have. And that is driven directly by the sin, directly by the negative act. The failure then becomes retroactively, again, only if the person then takes it and turns it around, 
becomes retroactively redefined and, now, and is now a positive influence in the person's life. But it turns out that there is actually another um, ascent. There's another aliyah that comes from sinning. We'll read it shortly in the Rebbe's words, but let me just set it up for a moment. Um, this is going to be from a talk that the Rebbe delivered in the winter of 1992. Um, and the Rebbe explains kind of generally speaking creation as going in three stages. Okay? Stage number one, God creates the world. He has an original vision. He wants a home for himself in this world. He has a vision for what he wants the world to look like. Stage two, our implementation of that vision, which, uh, let's be honest, usually is not precisely in line with the original vision which Hashem had. But nevertheless, that leads to stage three, which is the realization of the end goal, the actualization of the original vision. Think about it on a smaller level with, with the giving of the Torah at Sinai. What happens? God gives us the Torah. We have the first luchos, right? What is that if not for God laying out the vision for which he would, for how he would like to have a relationship with us? <laughs> and then shortly thereafter, we have our implementation of that vision with the sin of the golden calf, a couple other elements, you know, not exactly the perfect vision that God, that God envisioned. But that leads to stage three, which is the second tablets, which actually are a deeper relationship that we have with God. Why do we have to go through this whole process? Why couldn't we just go to stage three directly? Why do you need to be a stage one, then a mess up of stage two, and then get to a stage three? So the Rebbe explains. Larry, can you read for us, please? Text nine. Yeah. The first stage is revelation from above, which is ultimately beyond us and cannot become fully integrated with our reality. This friction allows for a possible implosion. By contrast, the second tablets were earned through human effort, our teshuva, and crafted by Moses, but not God. They were therefore suitable vehicles for the practical realization of God's ultimate plan. This is a very, very powerful point. And those of you that attended the Mashiach course, which I know it's a few of you on here, will be familiar with this idea. When God gave the Torah at Sinai, or whenever there's a stage one where God lays out an original plan, it's a beautiful plan, and God can make it happen right now. But it's not our plan. It's God's plan. And it's not coming from us. And it's not us adopting the vision of God and actually connecting to God on that level. It's not coming from us. It's coming from God. What happens after we mess up and then we come back to God is that now the vision is our vision. Now the, 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 the inspiration is our inspiration. When God reveals himself from above, above, let's think of the Mount Sinai, the first tablets, that was God just revealing himself to us. Did we accept it? Did, did it really permeate us? Not necessarily, right? But after the sin of the golden calf, when the Jewish people now returned to Hashem and they built a Mishkan for Hashem and they initiated a relationship with Hashem, now it became part and parcel of who, of who they were. And that is the basic, basic definition of teshuva. Teshuva is to discover that serving God is actually what I want to do. Not just something that God wants of me and therefore I will continue to do what God wants, but teshuva is to get on board with it in a real way that it's actually part of me. Now, the first time we tried to do it and get on board as part of me, there was too much me in the way. That's why we ended up with a set of the golden calf, right? That's, what, that's stage two. But after we mess up and we can appreciate that we can get deeper than that, we can actually figure out who we really are and that we really want to do what God wants, then we can truly appreciate the relationship with Hashem. And that is the level that comes after Teshuvah. I'm not just serving God because God wants, wants me to. I'm serving God because I want to as well. And by the way, this, this goes not just in the context of our relationship with God, this goes in the context of any relationship with any, any person, right? Think about it. Can you think of a time when you made a foolish choice and it led you to identify more strongly with your core values? You ever hear people, after they mess up with something, maybe, maybe because they messed up with you, and then they apologize to you and they say, oh, I wasn't myself. What do you mean you weren't yourself? You, of course you were yourself. You did it, you were you, you, were, you, you, you weren't yourself. What the person is saying is, allow me to do teshuva. Yes, I messed up, but that was because I wasn't digging deep enough to my core to really get to know our relationship. 
When a spouse says to another spouse, whether it's after being unfaithful or any other rocky, rocky section of the relationship, and they say to them, I wasn't myself, and now I've learned through the process of this terrible thing that I did and what it caused in our relationship. I'm not saying it was a good thing to do. It was still a terrible thing to do. But through that, it's actually affecting me in a way that I'm getting in tune with a deeper part of how much I love you. With, with at my core, who I, who I really am. So this can really be applied anywhere. I don't know, is there something wrong with this slide here? Now, obviously, as Danny and I think Kalman, both of them brought up, we have to ask this question. Do these ideas preclude feelings of guilt and remorse over our failures and mistakes? You know, maybe somebody makes a, messes, messes up really bad and uh, it's time to celebrate, let's make a party, right? Somebody finally transgresses the will of Hashem, they should throw a lavish feast. Now I have an opportunity based on my failure to go, right? Imagine the chutzpah, the chutzpah. Remember I, I was describing somebody who cheats on his wife and then he comes back to me and he says, honey, now we have an opportunity to grow in our relationship. <laughs> Not you idiot, right? I'm gonna slap you across the face. So, so no, these ideas definitely don't preclude them. And that's where we find that always when they are celebrated, it's always in past tense. Think about it this week's parsha. When are we summarizing? When are we learning what we gained out of our failures? Only after the failures happen. Nobody's saying you should, you should originally fail. But if you do, those failures have to lead to greater goods. So in this week's parsha, it's at the end of all 40 years of the journey. Let's go back to the to, to the uh, to the to the, the luchot, the tablets. You know, famously Rashi tells us. That after Moses broke the first tablets, uh, 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 God told him, Yashar Thank you for breaking them. But Danny, can you clarify for us in text 10? When did he say that? Don't forget to unmute yourself. <clears throat> there you go. God, God's congratulating Moses for breaking the first tablets is alluded to in the Torah in his instruction to Moses to fashion the second tablet. For it was only at the point, only at that point, that the advantage that the Jews gained through the shattering of the first tablets became apparent. So it's always in hindsight. In fact, the very the very phrase, the very specific phrase, Yerita Tzora Halia, that the, the descent was for an ascent, is phrased in past tense. It's always afterwards that we can look back and appreciate how we have grown from it, but not immediately after we fail, then we have to be busy go back, rebounding and going up. That's not an opportunity to see that. Um, but on the flip side, this doesn't mean that there's no relevance to this lesson, to this idea before, before a person rebounds. You, can have, you can't celebrate a failure, right? You can celebrate a rebound after a failure. You can celebrate the deep, the deep relationship that you have after the relationship was broken, but you can't celebrate a relationship being broken but the perspective can actually uh, uh, um, uh, uh, help us very, very much as we go along. Um, let's read text 11. Uh, Baron, uh, you know, it's Stephanie, sorry. I just realized you haven't read. Stephanie, if you can read for us, please, text 11. Rabbi Huna said, when a person transgresses and repents, it is the second time it's because permissible for him. Now, do you really think that the deeds became permissible? Rather, he means that it be becomes permissible in the eyes of the offender. I I'm sorry if, uh, Stephanie, your connection was a little bit choppy. But in short, what Rabbi Huna is saying in the Talmud is that sometimes after we do something negative, after we slip up, after we fail, it begins to, to seem to us as if it's not such a big deal, right? Has anybody ever noticed that once you fail at something, it's much, much harder to rebound from that, to, 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 to withstand that same temptation or that same scenario when you're confronted with it again? Why is that? Because the second time that we're confronted with the same situation, once we comprehend the shattering awful reality of a mistake, oh, hold on, that's, that's in a moment. Um, when, when we have failed, the next time we're approached with the same situation, the same scenario, 
we inevitably tell ourselves, I am weak. This is something that's not for me. In this regard, this is, this is a temptation that I cannot withstand. This is a situation that I cannot overpower. And inevitably, that weakness leads us to fail again. And again, and again, and again. Somebody earlier, I forget who it was, uh, described the vicious cycle. That when somebody fails, and that just leads to further failure, which leads to further failure. And we're not describing theory here, we're describing the facts of many people's lives. And perhaps the facts of many of us here's lives with certain elements of our lives, right? Think dieting, for, for example. Sure. Why is it that the more times you try to diet, the harder it gets? It's because in our minds now, we've convinced ourselves that this is something that's not, not that it's not a big deal, but it's something that's beyond my ability and it's something that I can't overpower. And that cannot be further from the truth. And that's where this perspective, even before you've rebounded, can really help you powerfully. Because imagine if the next time you're presented with this same failure, you realize, oh, oh my God, look at the opportunity I have. This is that same temptation again. This is my opportunity to rebound from that low state which I put myself in, from that failure within which I found myself, and now reach such a higher level than I ever could have reached, even without failing. Imagine if every time we approach that same situation, we're going to fail again. That's the first thing that pops into our mind. As the Rebbe elaborates in text 12, the moment that we apprehend the shattered off of reality of a mistake, that's how we can now choose to redefine that, that bad choice into a positive influence that's going to help us rebound. Let's do text 12. Um, Kalman, please. We must never despair, God forbid, regardless of our personal state. This holds true even if our spiritual state is objectively low and truly wretched, and even if we have made irresponsible choices and are fully to blame for bringing these, this miserable state of affairs upon ourselves. True, a sinner ought to wail and bemoan his transgressions and the evil that he has wrought in his soul. But at the same time, we must never lose hope of a brighter future. Rather, we must realize that although we cause this mess with our own free choice, it is simultaneously part of the divine plan. Clearly, then, it will lead us through adequate teshuva, so far greater heights, uh, to, far, to far greater heights that would have otherwise been possible. This is such a powerful point. You know, the Welt, you know, it was the world, the secular world, the world, whoever, right, the popular wisdom tells us when life gives you lemons, make lemonade, right? Which is essentially saying you have failed, make the best out of your situation and use it for whatever you can. You know what Hasidus tells us? Hasidus tells us that teshuva has to be done with joy. Returning to God after a failure should be done with joy. Simcha. Whoa, hold on a second. I thought you just said we're not supposed to celebrate when, when we fail. No, 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 Hasidus didn't say to celebrate the failure. Hasidah said that after the failure, and you've bemoaned the failure, now you should appreciate that you are in such a unique position that you should be able to dance your way through it. Why? Because if you truly appreciate the situation that you're in, imagine if a child knew when he fell, he knew that his parent was okay with him falling. Because, he, because his parent believes so much in him that he knows he's going to get up and run. This is the, the, the powerful perspective that this week's parasha gives us, not just after you rebounded from a failure, you look back and you say, you know what, I grew a little bit out of it. Life gave me lemons, I made lemonade. No, 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 no. Life gave me lemons and I realized that lemons was the only thing that could help me get through the day. That lemons put me in such a unique position that now I can be a millionaire. And that's why we dance our way through, through, through Teshuvah. We sing and we dance and we're joyous. Over the, over the situation in which we find ourselves. And this, my friends, is the key to breaking that vicious cycle. We fail once. Now, the first thing we want to do is get depressed over it, right? Oh my God, what did I do? I slipped up. I'm, I'm a terrible human being. I, I can't even get my active. I can't follow. I can't do it. I can't be a proper spouse. I can't be a proper parent. I can't. Says Hasidus, no, hold on a second. You think that you can deviate from God's plan? You think you can turn yourself into a terrible father or into a terrible spouse or into, or into a terrible Jew? By the way, I tell this to people all the time when they walk into shul and, 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 and I ask them, when's the last time you put on tefillin? And they say, oh, last time was my bar mitzvah. I'm a bad Jew. 
And I try to explain to them, no, you're not a bad Jew. And, and they're looking at me, I can't give them this whole class. But this is exactly what we're talking about. You really think that you are, you're so egotistical. You, you have such chutzpah that you think that you can take the neshama, the soul that God gave you and turn yourself into a bad Jew. That was not, that's like me saying Bina has the option to go run out on the street and get run over by a car. God forbid, right? Now, I would never allow that, that, that to be a possibility in her life. The very fact that you are where you are in your life today is proof of the fact that Hashem believes in you. Is proof of the fact that now is the moment to break the cycle and use that negative past failure to propel you forward, not just to grow from it, but to, to, to help you reach a height that you never could have reached in your life. How powerful is that? As the Rebbe concludes in text 13, um, Baron, if you can read for us, please. The sole purpose for which God created the possibility for sin is to enable us to arrive at the superior level of the Baal Teshuvah penitent. The entire function of sin is to create the possibility for a person to become banished from God's closeness, but with the express objective that the banished will not remain banished from him. We can therefore appreciate the ability of Teshuvah to correct our past failings. For the concept of sin was originally created only to serve as a facilitator for the advantage gained through Teshuvah. Thank you, Baron. You know, one question that we didn't ask at the beginning of the class that we possibly could have led with is why did Hashem create failure? Why did Hashem create sin? Maybe we asked a, a, a version of that question. Right? Why would Hashem create the ability in his life to do something terrible? And the answer is because it brings us to a greater good. And it, it, it comes from such a, a, a powerful Jewish axiom, which is that God is the ultimate good that there is in this world. And therefore, there's nothing ra yorin milmaila. The Talmud tells us there's no bad that comes down from the world. There's nothing negative that ever comes down from the world. So should mistakes bother us? Of course they should bother us. But mistakes should not, should not define us. As I said, don't give you, don't give in to your to, to your Yitzhar Hara, to your evil inclination when he says, now let the negative misdeed, the failure that you had, define you and say, you're a terrible Jew. You're a terrible person. You're a terrible spouse or, or whatever aspect of life it's in. No way. No way. You never are. The act that you did was terrible. But now, because of the amazing person that you are, and because nothing bad comes down from heaven, even that is not outside the pale of God's, of, of, of God's plan for this world. What is it? It's just a longer route to a deeper good that you can experience in your life, to a greater up that you can experience in your life. Everything that happens in this world is part of Hashem's plan. The lower we reach, the higher we can potentially bend. So whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's in the global Jewish life, whether it's the entire world, a mistake is bad, but the process that it brings about, the potential that it brings about is good. So go ahead and make it that way and sing your way through it. L'chaim, l'chaim, my friends. I am. A tremendous yashokach again to Marilyn for sponsoring tonight's class. Um, and I'd like to leave you with these parting words. In this week's parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu makes sure to give the Jewish people a, a, a summary of all of their experiences. The negative, I should say the positive together with the negative, and it's particularly the negative that he wants us to learn from and to recognize that these propelled us to greater heights. So that we should each learn in our own lives that whatever negative past misdeeds we may have, they are opportunities for the ultimate relationship with God, the deepest relationship with God, until we bring about Mashiach. So let's grab the ball by the horns and make it happen. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank Got you. it. Yes, Any questions? Thank you.